watching the Forefront Church video podcast. And wherever you're at viewing online, we just want to say thank you and welcome. And one of the ways that we can help connect with you is we want to hear from you and where you're at and how we can help. And so head over to ForefrontChurch.info after the message and click the Connect tab. It's a great way for us to help you along your spiritual journey as you connect with God and learn about Jesus. And so sit back, relax. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged from today's message. Well, I want to welcome everybody that's watching online. How are you guys doing? Everybody doing good? All right. You guys are excited. I am glad that you're here as we conclude our series, Six Little Words. Uh, we've been looking at all sorts of different things from uh, Dan did a phenomenal job. Give it up for Dan, by the way, last week, uh, talking about, uh, about help and how we need to open up about that. We went through when is enough enough? How do we say thanks? Not in a Chick-fil-A kind of way. But in a really genuinely, think, let's, let's be honest, it is not their pleasure. Um, they're just saying that. Um, but just to really be genuinely thankful for the circumstances that we have, good and bad. And just being like, all right, God, you're moving me through these, and you're going to teach me something through that. And we looked in the very first week about the power of yes and no, and not being afraid to say no, because there's going to be moments where people, they just want our yes all the time. And if we don't say yes, they get really angry. We need to not be fearful of that. And today we're looking at the power of sorry. And what, is, what does that look like in our lives? And, and I want to start off by asking you guys something. How many of you have ever been in a situation where someone explained something to you one way and it ended up being completely different, a bait and switch, if you will? How many of you have ever experienced that in your life? Yeah, quite a few of you. That's been something that has happened to me on occasion but no much more, so much so in 2011, uh, I was asked to be a part of going on a field trip for 12 three-year-olds. It, and I was told, it's going to be amazing. Your, your daughter and all the kids are going to love it. And you're just going to enjoy it. It's going to be an adventure. Would you love to sign on to be a part of this? And I was billed with all the things that were going to be awesome. And so I said, yes. And I was wrong. It, w it was not okay. I was naive, uh, gullible, whatever. I was raked in with all of the, don't you love your daughter? It'll be great. And so I went, and we went to Hunt Club Farm, where we brought all the kids there, and they were going to experience all of the animals and nature, and that, which is cool. They get to, you know exposed to that stuff and everything. And immediately when they all got out of their car seats, it's just like, and they ran everywhere. And there were four adults. The three ladies and myself, and the reason that she me is she said, you know, dads don't get to come a lot because their schedules are a little bit different. But you said in the forum earlier in the year that your schedule is flexible, and so can you come? And I'm like, yeah. And there I am trying to chase down 12 children and all the adults. Even though they got there and they look composed, it is the middle of October, and it was a little bit cool. We're all sweating. We all look like we just got beat up in a fight. And this is like minutes into it. And so we're chasing the kids around, and it, I mean, it's a little bit overwhelming. And we get to this one part, which I don't know who thought this was a good idea, but they have this like tadpole frog thing. And it had a little area where all the kids could get up on the edge and look at the tadpoles. Well, if you stick 12 three-year-olds around a little pool, what are they going to do? Not, well, yeah, nobody jumped in it that day, but they're definitely going to stick their hand in you can't, you can't stick a kid around water and be like, don't touch it. They're going to be like, what have you been right in? And so immediately, all of the girls, and I was standing uh, with mainly the, the little three-year-old girls because I have a daughter, and so we're standing over there, and all of them are just like, 
oh, this is so neat, whatever. All the boys, boom, arms in the water, trying to ground. They're like, look, I got, and the person's look on their face looked like nobody had thought this through at Hunt Club that kids might actually just dive into and pick up, like, ah, and kill it. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And the person's like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't get it. And two of the boys put their arms in at the same area, and they grabbed, and the one boy was a little bit bigger, and he kind of was aggressive and got it first, and the other boy was not having, you do whatever, and they were kind of been pushing at one another a bit, and I was just looking at them going like, I'm glad I have daughters, and so they're pushing at one another and, and doing their thing, and then, sure enough, as they're getting ready to kind of walk away, the bigger kid shoves the other one down into the mud. And yeah, uh uh-oh. And shoves him down in the mud, and he's upset, and he's whatever. The teacher kind of pulls him off to the side and, you know, explains, you know, you need to say sorry, 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 and do their thing. And they say they're, you know, they're sorry's, and they move on. And I'm thinking, all right, that's the end of it. And we're looking at one of the other things there. I forget if it was, like, the chickens and whatever that's there, if you've ever been there. But we're standing at one of the things, and the boy who was a little more aggressive walks up to him. And and he, like, has his hands clenched. And I'm like, there's going to be another fight. Um, But he's a, I'm sorry, I'm a bad friend. He, like, does it to the other kid. (laughs) The other kid said, yes, you are. And they hug. Because they, like, somewhere they've been taught that you got to hug this out. Which I was like, that's pretty. And they hug, but they're both, like, we're sorry together, and they're hugging it out, and I'm like, this is weird, Um, but I was really encouraged by the scene, because they weren't prompted to do that, they were prompted earlier to say the sorry, 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 but watching them do that moment, I go, man, there's something really special about genuinely seeing that you've hurt someone, about looking at a situation saying, I've messed up. And I need to say, and it doesn't always mean that you're going to like the sorry. It means it might be difficult for you. I'm sure that none of us have difficulty, except me in this room, saying, I'm sorry. I'll tell you what, I I don't like saying sorry. There's moments in my life where I'm just like, I don't want to say it. There's things going on. I've had a bad day. I'm going to say, uh, I've had a bad day, you know, and I just, it's because of whatever. And around our house, it's not so much for me, but with my wife and, and our girls, if I don't feed them right away, there's some things that are said that everybody regrets. It's that whole thing we jokingly say, the hangry piece. Like, if I don't, if I see it coming, if I don't feed them, there's going to be some words said, and then someone's going to have to come back later. I'm sorry for what I said when I was hungry. <laughs> I was hungry. There's moments that we have where, and I watch it with our youngest, that she's still little and so she needs to take a nap. And if she doesn't get a nap by like that 3.30, maybe like 4 o'clock thing, you can tell. She's like, la, 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 Like she, there's a, there is a threshold where we go, not giving you a nap was a bad idea. And we need to, we need to get you a nap. And, and later, she'll come up to us, and she'll crawl up, you know, sitting in the chair. She'll crawl up, Daddy, I was sorry. I was, I was tired. Yes, you were. <laughs> sure. But I think owning that is huge. Because we don't get to make caveats and excuses for why our behavior or our day or the life situation that we're in calls us to a place where we just go, you know what, I don't have to say sorry. The reality is that the power of sorry is huge. And we, we make it a big deal in other instances when we move through our, our anger and we come out on the other side joyful, when we, you know, when we are experiencing pride and these things are overwhelmed, we come out on the other side, we have a big deal about it. We want to make sure, you know, hey, I'm conquering this, I'm moving through this. But then when it comes to sorry, we're just like, "Mm -mm, don't want to do it. Hey, I need you. In in, in parenting, that's been difficult for us. Hey, I need you to say, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. No, you're going to, we need you to do that. We want to express that what we've done is not okay. And that hurts somebody else. And not like, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Because that's not an apology. That's saying you got something going on. It's not owning what transpired. And so maybe for some of us, what we need to do is really buckle down 
And if you don't get anything else, my prayer is that you get this because if you can move in this well, it will change your life and how you navigate faith and honoring God. And that's that you and I need to show up to the sorry party. We need to show up, the party hat, the whistleboard, the whole bit, own the moment, show up and be ready to say what needs to be said, to be sincere. And here's the reality that whatever happens, you're going to be better for it on the other side. If that person does not forgive you, you're going to be better for saying sorry. That if you move in something where you have had a moment where you said something wrong, you did something wrong, you acted in a way that was inappropriate, the best thing that you and I can do is show up in that moment. And I know that it's difficult, but to show up in the moment and say, you know what? What I did was not okay. How I acted, how I treated you, and the end result was not healthy, and it hurt you, and I can see that, and I'm sorry. We're walking through culturally what I think is a, a beautiful movement of people being more honest, being brave, coming forward and saying to family members, to friends, to whoever, what you did was not okay. Now let's talk about that and walk through what it means to own what we're doing and say sorry. Brene Brown is a, a fabulous author. I quoted her a couple weeks ago. She just, she writes these books that like, um, that will definitely convict you and just challenge you. Um, if you are easily offended, uh, sometimes she curses in her books, and so I would say don't get them. Um, but she shared this, and I believe that it's so true, is sometimes the bravest and most important thing you can do is just show up. To just be able to say, you know what, I need to call somebody and we need to get on the phone and schedule a time to get face to face and I need to show up and I'm not ready but I'm going to show up because I need to say the hard things. I need to say what's true. and I need to take ownership of what's happening with me. And today what we're going to look at are four of the most important things that takes place when we use the power of our words most specifically, the power of using the word sorry. And I'm not talking about saying sorry and then everything's fine. We're going to get to that in a little bit. So if you're thinking, oh, Jason, does sorry wipe away everything and negate the situation? No. So, so what I don't want you to leave with today is saying, oh, if someone says sorry, then everything's fine. No, it's not always fine. There are times when things are difficult. There are times when someone has been so hurtful that you may accept an apology, and you may even extend forgiveness, but that relationship may terminate. That relationship may be done. That friendship, maybe even that marriage, depending on what's taken place, that there might be some things that are too far gone that while you say, I forgive you, and God forgives you, I don't know that this can continue on. We may have to go separate ways. But we want to look at how we can harness the power of our words. I've been talking about this for the last five weeks, about how you and I can be honorable with what we do. And if you have a Bible and you want to track along with us today, we're going to be over in the book of James chapter 5 is where we're first at, but we're going to bounce around a little bit. And so what I would suggest is go over to ForefrontChurch.com info and swipe over to the notes section. That'll have everything we're looking at today. Also has a digital Bible. And if you don't have a Bible today, I want to let you know we give them away for free in the lobby. There's no catch. You don't even have to sign up for anything. We want to give you a brand new Bible because we feel it is so important that people growing in their faith and learning about God have a Bible that they can understand. We're even going to look at a new series we start next week at the end of service about how you and I can engage our faith when it comes to the Bible. And so as we sift through these things, I want to look at four things. Are you guys ready? Five of you are. Awesome. Everybody online use a hand emoji. I'm sure you're more engaged than the people that are in here. But we're going to continue on anyway, so it really doesn't matter. You're along for the ride. First and foremost, number one, Sorry admits what you have what? Done. Sorry admits what you have done. This is taking ownership and responsibility if in any way that you may have wronged somebody that you say, you know what? What I've done isn't okay and I am going to say I'm sorry. You know, I, I can tell you 
from firsthand experience that I walked through a, a very angry time in my life. I don't really can't put a finger on why I was that way, but I was just kind of an angry, abrasive individual uh, through my teenage years. I mean, part of that's being a teenager, but uh, through my teenage years and early 20s, it was just kind of, and one of the things that was difficult is saying the words, I'm sorry, when they would happen. That, and we have to be able to come to a place where we say, you know what? Maybe I did something wrong. Maybe there might be something that happened. And we can look all across the landscape of, uh, from media to politics to you name it, and see instances of this. Well, we'll name a few of them. There was an interview that happened with Jimmy Fallon and uh, President, well, before then it was President-elect Trump. And no matter what your politics are as a leader, he's interviewing him and saying the things. He said, hey, uh, you t use Twitter a lot? I said, yeah. I said, if, the, if there was ever an instance where someone said something to you, and you need to apologize, would you do it? And he kind of says, well, in the moment that I do something wrong, I'll apologize. And Jimmy kind of laughs about it. And it's like, you know, there might be an opportunity for us to admit if, if there's ever anything that we did wrong that we would say. I did something wrong. You look at, uh, how many of you guys like uh, The Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson? Anybody a fan of that guy? He's, he's a fun guy. Um, but him and Kevin Hart, they're a weird bunch, those two guys. And they were actually in an interview with on The Ellen Show, and they're just, they poke fun at each other all the time. And they're just you know doing their thing, and, and The Rock kind of says something to Kevin Hart. He's like, man, that hurt my feelings. And he's like, you're fine. It keeps moving on. Like there's no like admittance of like, hey, I did anything wrong. I might have hurt you. Uh, one of probably the most famous instance right now is uh, the Jesse Smollett instance of what's going on through there and what's happening there. And again, regardless of where you land with things, there's a moment in the Robin Roberts interview where she says, what about the people that say that you may, that you may have been a part of it? And, and immediately glazes over it. And I wonder... And there's all kinds of psychological things that happen, no matter where we find ourselves, where we may not be able to see. Maybe it was our upbringing. Maybe it was the, the way that we surrounded ourselves with certain people. No matter where you land in life, there are instances that would maybe cloud our vision to see where we've actually hurt someone, where we've actually done wrong. An instance where we might need to say, I'm sorry. Because sorry admits that you have done something wrong. It admits what you've done. Over in the book of James where you've been holding, James, the half-brother of Jesus, shares these words. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. That whatever's going on, whatever's happening, that we take time to open up and say, I have owned what I have done. I have messed up. I have sinned. I have done something wrong, and I need to confess that. And I'm repentant of that. I want to say I'm sorry for that. And you will be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. But one of the things that is difficult in seeing what you've done and saying sorry, sorry is admitting that you have done something, I think that it could be possible for you and I that we were brought up within a culture, within a household, within a family structure, people around us that we might not even be able to see when we've hurt somebody. And I would ask this, is seeing you've wronged someone difficult for you? If you have hurt someone, do, have you ever had someone say to you, I don't understand why you can't see how what you did hurt me. The what you said to me caused me pain and it doesn't seem like you uh, care. If you've had instances in your life in a context like that where someone has said those things, it could be very possible that you grew up in a household that never apologized for anything. That you grew up within a, a construct where you just didn't express, understand, and get shown empathy. And so when someone hurts, it just kind of glazes over. Can you see when you hurt others? And if that's something where you just go, man, I, I don't know if I can, I would ask you this is when was the last time you said sorry? And you might be like, actually, I'm doing pretty good. I don't hurt anybody. I'm fine. I don't need to say sorry if you don't mess up. <laughs> now, I'm sure most of you guys are absolutely perfect. But man, I can tell you time and time again, I have to go back, whether it's my daughters. You know, I, being a parent, I, in, 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 anybody who is a kid right now, I want you to hear this. Your parents mess up in parenting. 
And when they do, they should apologize. And there are times where I have to go to my kids where something will happen and I'll watch a kid like throw themselves off the couch and I'm like, someone's going to die. And I'll yell. I'll scream. And one of the things we have around the house is we're not going to yell. But I'll yell. Why? Because it's, it's, it's a dangerous moment. You've got to yell. You're never. But it terrifies them. And the way I reacted to that could have been different. And the way I handled it could have been different. So I have to go back to my kids sometimes and say, hey, what daddy did was not okay. I'm sorry. When's the last time that you uttered those words? Because I'll tell you what, when we maneuver friendships, marriage, working with coworkers, I'm sure there is a coworker at the job that you work at that you love. And I'm sure there's a coworker at your work where you're just like, oh, Jesus, like, are you going to flood the earth twice because it's been raining a lot? And if you do, can you take them? Like you're, you felt that way about them. If you've felt that way on the inside, it doesn't mean you have to like everybody, but if you've felt ways and thought things and been mean, even within your own mind, that is sin. Could it be that you and I need to go to someone and say, you know what, I may not have said it outright, but I, the way I've thought about you isn't okay. And you may never know, but it's weighed on me. And I want to let you know, I'm sorry. The power of that is absolutely huge. And when it comes to connection with God, one of the things that I learned about a decade ago is this, and this is our second piece, that sorry breaks through worship barriers. I meet people who would say, man, I came to service and I just didn't feel it. And well, first of all, God is more about our honor and worship than our feeling. Um, it's not about the, how we feel. It's about who we honor. But you'd say, man, I just don't feel like I'm connecting. I don't feel like I'm there. And I go, well, could it be? that you have things that are a roadblock to connecting with God. And go, what do you mean by that? So, well, let's turn over to the book of Matthew. Matthew notes some of this. It says, therefore, if you're offering a gift at the altar, if you're in worship, this is our worship together. If you're offering a gift at the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, you have messed up, you own it, that you have sinned, that you have hurt them, leave your gift there in front of the altar First go and be reconciled to them, then come back and offer your gift. In the 20 plus years that I've preached that, I've never seen someone get up and leave going, yep, I should probably do that. But you know what, it's interesting because I think for us, there are moments where we have done things and hurt people and said things, whether it's a, you know, our immediate family, mom, dad, coworker, whatever they go, Man, I don't know why I'm connecting. And God would go, I actually know exactly why you're not connecting. Because you have a barrier between me because you haven't gone and done what you know you need to do. One of the writers in Peter shares with us, says uh, that you and I, is, and talk to the husbands this morning, that you should treat your wife with honor so that your prayers aren't hindered. Guys, if you know that if you are not honoring your wife with every part of what God made her and designed her, that your prayers, that they just kind of hit this ceiling. You go, I don't understand why I'm not connecting with God. God goes, I know exactly why. You need to go and you need to honor your spouse. And all the women here are like, mm, preach that. <laughs> Tell them. And I get it. That, but if your connection and I meet people go, I just, I'm not connecting. I'm not able to break through that. One of the other writers writes in, the, in Psalm, the Old Testament, he says, no good thing will be withheld to those who walk upright. God says that if you and I aren't living a life of honor, that God's going to go, man, there's things that I want to do in your life and things that I want to give you, I'm just not right now. And we go, I don't understand why I'm not breaking through in my job and with my friends and in this movement. And God's like, I would do every bit of those things if you would act honorably. Because if you're going to act dishonorably, there's no reason why I should give you all those pieces in the first place. See, God has already given us the tools to do this. And this uh, quote by A.W. Tozer that we're about to see has wrecked me for years. Because I hear people that pray in a small group and in settings, and I'll hear them where they've just been praying, man, I want to be able to serve, but I need to get clarity on where God's going. So just serve. Just help people. Well, you know, I need to pray about it and figure out what I'm going to do. So no, God commands you to serve, so you just go and serve. Like, I don't think that God's going to be like, you really messed up that whole caring for people thing. Like, but there, no, I need to pray. I need to get clarity on whatever. No, you just need to do it. He commands you to do it, and so you do it. A.W. Tozer puts it this way. He shares, if God gives you a watch, are you honoring him more by asking him what the time is? or by simply consulting the watch. 
That God has already given you and I the tools to break through these barriers. And if God has said, you dishonor someone, you go and apologize. We don't go, God, I need to pray about that on whether or not you go say sorry. No, just go say sorry. That we would go and do that. And what I, the question I would ask you is, could it be you're not connecting with God because of your unwillingness to own your mistake? Could it be that you're not connecting with God because of your unwillingness, your begrudging nature to say the words, I'm sorry? Because when it does happen, when it is genuine sorrow and repentance, you want to turn from what you did, you care about the other person and how you impacted them, sorry says, I love you like Jesus. That I care about you, that you have value, you have worth, you are made unique. And I want nothing more than for you to know that how I impacted you is not okay. And God, I just want, before God and before them, say, I'm sorry, I love you, I can't take that back, but I want you to know that what happened wasn't okay. How do we receive that when that happens? Because I've met people who go, so-and-so hurt me, never forgiven them. And I'm like, really? Really? Now, I get it. If you don't claim faith and you're having a difficult time with that, the very human condition is one of, I want justice. I want them to get what they deserve. And so I get and I understand that you and I desperately want people to meet that, that's why we, we love our, you know, love it or hate it, we want justice. We want to be able to see if this happened, there should be repercussions for it. If you wrong, there should be a punishment. Now, I'm not saying that shouldn't be the case. God definitely says, I mean, but one of the things I love about God is God goes, hey, all of you have sinned, all of you have fallen short, all of you deserve to be punished, and yet I'm going to send Jesus. And so the very antithesis of justice happens for you and I when we come to faith. That you and I get to be set free. And so I love and hate this next verse. You might be like, a pastor just said he hated the uh, verse in the Bible. I love and hate this because, quite honestly, if you're reading the Bible and you agree with everything that's in there, then you're making out God to be a lot like you. But when you read the Bible and you open it up and there's things that rub you the wrong way, it means that you're really trying to search for what is true. And when I read this verse, it's difficult. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as Christ God, what? Forgave you. And I go, oh, that, God, why'd you got to go? Why'd you have to do that? Like, God, I'm thankful that you did that for me. I mean, I don't want to do that to that person. Do you know what they did? Do you know who they are? Guy goes, yeah, I made them. I know exactly who they are. I know exactly what they've done. I know every bit of them, and I know every bit of you, and I forgave them just as much as I forgive you. Now go and do the same. And if, if we can be honest anywhere, it should be within the context of this gathering. And that's hard. I mean, we should be able to say, that is hard. To say, I, God, because we have levels, don't we? We have levels of our threshold of what is like forgivable and not. Like if, if I were to throw a piece of trash down in the street and not pick it up, there's probably a good cross section of y'all that throw a little judgment my way. You'd be like, man, that guy's a jerk. But you wouldn't say, that guy deserves to be put in the electric chair. No, you'd be like, I'm just not going to hang with him. But, but we would have a level if we said, well, what if, Somebody takes somebody else's life in a rage. How we respond to that shows how we weigh what people do right and wrong. I'm not saying I'm any different from you. I have those things made up in my mind and God goes, I wipe the slate clean from the person that litters and breaks a little law to the person that murders. And so... One of the most difficult premises of the life and teachings of Jesus is how do you and I accept apologies? How do we forgive? 
Because what we see and what we are taught is how we forgive should be in the same way that we are forgiven. And that is so hard. And if you struggle with that, I want to let you know that is your humanity and your faith and the Holy Spirit doing this inside of your very being as you accept Christ, as you follow Him. And if that's difficult, me too. But we are forgiven as much as we forgive. But I want you to hear this because what the next thing is, well, if I forgive, then what I'm saying is that everything is okay. No. Sorry doesn't mean it's all better. And I really want you to hear this because you and I may have this misconception that somehow, some way, if I give forgiveness, then what they did is wiped clean. No, there's still a wound there. There's still the cracks and the hurt and the heartache. Those things are still very real. And I'm not saying in the moment that someone has hurt you and they say that they're sorry, that you forgive them and then everything goes back to normal because sometimes it doesn't. Corey Tin Boone, she uh, was in, walked through the Holocaust and um, was put in a concentration camp for, for helping people, her and her family. And when she did, she was in a camp with her sister. And her and her sister were, were there, and, and they were malnourished. They were, they were beaten. They were stripped down. And in one of the instances within the camp, the guards had them stripped down completely naked and run around in front of all of the guards and made fun of them and, and laughed at them, skin and bones. And, and Corey recounts this moment where she looked through the window of, of one of the rooms. She was outside looking in at her sister had been held there for a while. And slowly her sister was so malnourished that she passed away because of lack of care and treatment. Well, things change. The camp and the, the war is over. She finds refuge in the States and she is following Jesus. She says, I need to go back and, and speak of the, the premise of forgiveness. And of all the places that she wanted to go and teach us, she went to Germany. Now, this was fresh on the heels of all that had transpired during the war. And she was going from church to school to town hall, wherever she could, to preach a message of forgiveness and her story. And as she was ending one night, and most people would kind of come and hear it, but they weren't ready. It was still so fresh. Most of them would just come and hear it, and much like many church services go, that was good, and move on, and not actually apply what they had heard. And she gets done one night, and this gentleman comes walking down the aisle. He says, ma'am, I, I want to thank you for what you said. And she was locked in her tracks because as she looked up, she saw and recognized this man. This is one of the guards that was at the camp that her sister was at, one of the very guards that had them stripped down and parade themselves. He said, I started engaging in my faith and, and I've turned my life around. I, I was at that camp and I want to thank you for your message and I want to say I'm sorry. Corey shares that every bit inside of her wanted to just pounce on this man about what he had done, what he had said, how he had treated them. She said, God, I don't know that I can do this. She said, God, I, the least that I can do is show up and I'm going I'm to stick my arm out, but I'm not ready. I'm going to need you to do the rest. She sticks her arm out to this man, this former guard, and grabs his hand, and she recounts that this warmth and movement came through her arm that she had never experienced. She goes, I know what happened. God began to give me the feeling, even, when I, even though I didn't feel it, and I wasn't ready. God challenged me to practice what I preach. And how am I going to get up and say we need to be forgiving if I can't first forgive? You see, sorry doesn't make it all better. 
And I want you to always remember an apology is a showing of, of their interest in you, good or bad. There may be ill intention there. There may not be. But it's a showing that I care about you in some way, and I want to mend the road that is happening. And before you walk in bitterness, my prayer is that you would believe the best about people, that people can change. Because if we don't believe that people can change, then all of us are in for a lifetime of agony because all of us have hurt. And you are not the sum of your hurts. You claim your identity in the name of Jesus. And God loves you. And God cares about you. Even in spite of all you've done. So I'd ask you two questions. First, who do you need to apologize to today so you can begin healing? Who is it that, and you have that name already, and you're like, I hate that that name is in my head right now. That's the person you need to call up. You need to invite out for coffee. Don't send a text message. That's the coward's way out. Get a voice behind it if they're too far away. If they're close, get a meetup. Hey, I want to let you know, I'm sorry. But maybe on the flip side of that, what's even more difficult sometimes is who do you need to forgive so you can feel the weight of the situation handled by Jesus? Because you've been waiting for them just to feel every bit of punishment and justice. And you've heard it said more than likely that you know, this grudge, this hurt, is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. At what point are you and I going to realize that the only way that we find freedom is when we actually walk through forgiveness? It doesn't mean that we say it's okay. But we say that God's big enough to begin to heal us and to set us free. And that starts with an apology. It starts with showing up to the sorry party. Own the moment. Be sincere. Whatever happens, you're going to be better for it on the other side. And I can't make you walk that out. But will you? But will you? Thanks for tuning in to the Forefront Church video podcast. Our hope and prayer is that this has left you encouraged and challenged you in your faith. And you might have some questions and some ways that you want to figure this out. And we want to help with that. Head over to ForefrontChurch.info and there's a couple different ways that you can connect. Click the connect tab and let us know how we can be praying for you or a staff member can be contacting you this week. Maybe you have just been encouraged by this and want to support the ministry here at Forefront Church. You can click the giving tab as well as other tabs that are in there to help you along in your journey with God. And so we're thankful for you. Thanks for tuning in. And we cannot wait to see you again here online on the video podcast. We love you and we'll see you then.